I'm Fernando Guerra. I'd like to welcome you to the 2009 Urban Lecture Series, sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. We sponsor these seminars throughout the spring with Channel 36. We have a great lineup for you tonight. For more information about tonight's lineup and future lineups, please uh, check our website at www.lmu.edu. Enjoy tonight's panel. Um, I am Fernando Guerra, director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and professor of political science and professor of Chicana Chicano studies here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, this is the uh, eighth annual urban lecture series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Now, we've been doing this in conjunction with Channel 36 for the last five years, and we're probably going to broadcast about eight shows through, uh, this spring. So welcome to all of you out there in television land and to especially to the students here at Loyola Marymount University. If you have any questions about this uh, um, lecture series, please visit our website, which is www.lmu.edu. Okay? Um, we have a great panel today, I think. We'll decide that afterwards. But uh, uh, immediately to uh, my left is uh, Ruth Galanter, who is the former council member of, the, of Great Westchester. Uh, it actually expanded beyond Westchester, but we at Loyola Marymount University don't care about that. She represented Westchester uh, for a, a long time. Now she is a sought after a consultant and advisor, especially on environmental issues. Um, ne next to uh, uh, Ruth, we have Brendan Huffman. He is formerly executive director of VICA, the Valley Industry Council Association, or what's the commerce? And what's the A stand for? The Valley Industry Commerce Association, okay? He was doing a great job and then something happened, he got fired. Um, oh no, excuse me, you, you quit. Oh, that was, <laughs> I, got, I got him mixed up. So, former council member, former executive director of a business association, and now former editor of the Daily News is Ron Kay. The Daily News is a very important voice for the San Fernando Valley, though you can read it and talks about all of Los Angeles and Southern California, but it has always been seen as the voice of the San Fernando Valley. Ron Kay was its editor for a long time, and as, as he said, he uh, left the paper involuntarily. Um, okay. And then uh, J.D. Waldy is one of the great spokespersons and writers uh, about Los Angeles. The Los Angeles Times has called him one of the most important voices in, in, in our city. He uh, also, his day job is actually working for the city of Lakewood in the, in the planning department. But uh, in the past, I've used his books for, uh, for our class, and he's been a, a great uh, um, a participant on this lecture series and, and uh, other activities that we do here at Loyola Marymount University. Um, today's topic is, because I couldn't come up on how to bring these, th these four groups together, I called it LA a subject. And of course, many of my panelists said, what the heck are you talking about? Only an academic would come up with a title like that. But the idea here is that um, I always find it that it's easier for someone to talk about uh, the, their, their former uh, lives or their former professions or their former employers when they're former. And so that's why we have a former council member, a former executive of a business group, and a former uh, editor. Uh, you know, uh, J.D. Waldy is not a former... Uh, I'm not a former anything. Yeah. I'm a former altar boy. Yeah. Uh, let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> So, um, but one, one of the, uh, uh, you know, the, so we have the different perspectives, politics, economics, uh, social, cultural, which, uh, and, and then also from the journalistic perspective. So, you know, we're going to start with um, Ron, Ron Kay to talk about uh, um, what the role of the media has been in terms of Los Angeles. Uh, the LA Times last week announced that um, they are getting rid of the California section of the newspaper. That is the one section that talks about California politics and LA politics, okay? And they're gonna supposedly merge local politics, meaning LA, it is the LA Times, into the front section. And then they're gonna put the obituaries over the sports. So I don't know if they're talking about the Dodgers or what's going on with that. Uh, and then they will, well, they're basically talking about LMU basketball, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> They, so, 
and the daily news, its circulation has declined. It's also gotten a little bit thinner. Uh, it, it, so what is happening with newspapers? And I'm going to make a prediction that the Los Angeles Times will not exist in five years. Ooh. Um, I don't know if I agree with it, but it's all their fault if it doesn't. Yeah. Because young people don't read newspapers. Why should they? Uh, I don't know why. Now that I've not been a newspaper man for the last eight or nine months, I realize what a terrible job we did and how little we knew, how much we covered government and not reality, not the life out in the streets and the neighborhoods and people's experience. And, and uh, I've been an activist uh, and blogger since uh, April, uh, doing what I've done for a long time, which is criticizing, challenging, uh, reporting on the city of Los Angeles and its endless failings to serve the public of Los Angeles. Um, is this not on? I don't really need it. I can talk very loud. The, the, um, uh, as a blogger, though, uh, it's, I was a journalist for 44 years. I worked in um, nine different papers all over the world, news magazines, you name it. And uh, came to LA, worked at the Herald Examiner, and wound up at the Daily News in 85 when it was really becoming converted from the world's most successful and awful new, uh, shopper, free throwaway, to uh, a real newspaper that was trying to be professional. And it was an incredible opportunity for me and, and to give voice to the San Fernando Valley, to stand up for middle class people everywhere in the city and, and for a better city. Um, now I'm fighting for a better city for the whole, s all over the city and have been everywhere. And um, what I see in newspapers, uh, it's, it's everybody's bemoaning the end of the California section. It was a dreadful and unfocused section that really didn't say very much. And, th and the trouble with the LA Times, I've called them criminal many, many times for their neglect of the city, their lack of mission, their lack of vision, their lack of the courage to stand up and say, this is what makes a great city. This is what we need to do. Whether they were right or wrong or whether you agreed with them, I believed that's what a newspaper was. There's a great article in the New Yorker, to, uh, I think it's this week, um, tracing the history of American journalism during prior to the revolution, from colonial days through the revolution. And the first newspaper editor was a guy in Boston named James Franklin, who had the daring courage to attack Cotton Mather and, and the whole uh, incredible uh, religion that he was pushing forward. It libeled him, slandered him, revealed things about him, it was eventually jailed. Um, but it was the beginning of the First Amendment. And the First Amendment was built in the belief that truth had a power and that if everybody said what they really believed, if everybody argued and talked, that the truth would prevail over time. And as a journalist, that's what I believed in. Uh, I didn't have to be right. I didn't even have to be accurate. I just had to be passionate and strive for something greater uh, for the community and for the truth. I, my accusation against the LA Times is it's never been that. Up until the early 60s, it was one of the worst papers in America and everybody's a poll, then it became a great newspaper with a global focus, New York Times West. I honestly believe that commercially, in their desperation, that they are going to start standing up for Los Angeles. They're going to start enunciating um, a vision of a greater city. And, and this is a place that should be a great city. Um, a new culture is being born in your generation. I call it the fusion culture where people from all over the world of all races, nationalities, languages are coming together and putting all that aside and becoming, creating something new that we don't really understand, but something's happening. And yet we're being divided by the race and class and geography um, for political advantage. Uh, and I think the LA Times can do a great job. I think it'll be the only surviving paper within this year, actually. I think the Daily News will probably either go out of business or become the Valley section of it. And, and I think the Times will essentially be the paper of... Hey, what, what about La Opinion? You don't think that's going to survive? Well, yeah, I think it's got a strong base, but it hasn't grown in years. Right. But mean, it hasn't also declined to the same degree, relatively speaking. Well, all over the country, ethnic papers have a strong market. Um, specialty papers, business papers uh, have a strong market. It's the mainstream general interest paper that has lost its focus, and I can tell you the long history. It has a lot to do 
with, there were twice as many papers in America until television. And in the 50s and early 60s, half of them went out of business. So, but Ron, you talked about passion. What, there's such a thing as, you know, when I was being educated, we talked about newspapers had to be objective. And when you're objective, you're not passionate. And so the, and when you take a look, you went all the way back to that Atlantic Monthly article, talks about the history and the origins of newspapers. They took a position. They weren't objective. You had the liberal, and they didn't call them that in those days, but you had a paper that took one perspective and another, and they got their facts pretty much wrong a lot of times. It's objectivity that supposedly created the New York Times, the LA Times. Yeah, but, but wait, that. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Hmm? When I was going to school and working on my school newspapers, they made a big deal, and actually when I was in college too, in the journalism department, mm -hmm. they made a big deal out of the fact that in the news columns, you're supposed yes. In the news columns, you're supposed to pay. There's no way, there's no such thing, despite what all your academics say, no such thing as value free social science. That I agree there with. No such thing as value-free journalism, but yeah. Yeah, I thought so. But the um, we were trying to silence your voice. No, so. people have been trying to do that. I know for that. Years for now. <laughs> um, the uh, in in the news columns, you were supposed to present facts. You were supposed to worry about whether it's accurate or accurate or not. And in fact, the most recent New Yorker, after the one with the article on the history of journalism, has a John McPhee article about fact-checking which is pretty interesting too, which I read today. The, but in the editorials, which were clearly differentiated, you could be mm -hmm. as passionate as you wanted. What I think has happened to the LA Times is it's replaced a lot of its news with feature stories. And that's presumably to entice people like you to read the paper. So here's my question. Does anybody here read the LA Times? That's a good one. Let's do a survey. Who, raise your hand if you read the newspaper today, the LA Times today. A different mix. Okay. That's more now, than I thought. Okay. Now, I'm, raise your hand if you've ever read the Daily News. All right. News. Hey. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, the last time I was here and asked, I was here on a panel talking about homelessness, and I was trying to explain to the student audience that the person who's probably the, had the single most significant influence on the public consciousness about homelessness is not a guy who runs an agency to take care of homeless people. It's um, an LA Times columnist. Everybody reads his column and everybody followed what was going on there. That was passion. Yeah, that's Steve Lopez. Steve Lopez. And it was not, um, it was also factual. Right. So that's what I was. Mr. Waldy, you. Nobody read, nobody in the audience read the LA Times. So I'm pleased to see that anybody did. You're in the LA Times all the all the time. I mean, <laughs> formerly all the time, yeah. So, what do you think about this debate? Will the LA Times exist in five years? And if so, in what form? Uh, it, why, and why should the students read will that? Will we care? <laughs> oh, those are those are all really compelling questions. Um, I think I'll answer the, the easy one first. Is is, is the caring? Um, something about a common source of information in a city makes that city. If that's missing, then you're missing an element that makes a city. There's something about a, a, a common shared pool of stories about a place, both historical and contemporary, that makes a place a place. When, those, when that pool of stories, that common network of stories is missing, there's something less about that place until it becomes pl kind of placeless, which often describes Los Angeles. I think people will read something online, uh, probably not made out of dead trees, in five, six, eight, ten years. But what they're going to be looking for, apart from enough information to make their daily lives make sense, they're going to be looking for, for a voice. They're going to be looking for some, some perspective on what it means to live here. They're going to be looking for a, a voice in that publication, whatever it might be, online or, or some other form. And if they're not finding that voice, if they're not hearing that voice, they're, they'll drop it, they'll put it down, they'll walk away from it. What, what I find missing in the LA Times, along with all the things that Ron has said, I, what I find missing in the LA Times is voices. I don't hear, except for one or two instances among columnists, I don't hear anything in those news stories. I don't hear a voice, I don't hear a mind thinking on paper. It's never instance. had an editor who supplied that vision or had permission to supply a vision. It's chased Pulitzer Prizes and status. It's, it's, 
The reason I call it criminal is that it's had the chance to provide that vision, that voice, that uplifting sense of place that's missing in Los Angeles. And uh, how that gets filled uh, is another question. I think it's in the internet myself, and, and I think it's going to come very quickly in the next couple of years. Let me be clear. I, I, Ron and I are not talking about boosterism. Uh, Los Angeles and the LA Times have lived, uh, 100, lived 120 years on, on the fruits of boosterism. We're not talking about boosting Los Angeles. Well, describe boosterism and how it manifested itself um, with the Times, especially. The city of Los Angeles sold itself into existence in the late 19th century. Uh, Harrison Gray Otis, the, the um, uh, charismatic owner of the Los Angeles Times, uh, used it as a vehicle to communicate to a larger world, mostly in the East Coast, that uh, Los Angeles was the, the, was the uh, center of health, wealth, and happiness in the sunshine. Isn't it? Well, um, sunshine. It uh, um, and well, not today, but. And there was a, there was a, great, there was a great civic uh, mission uh, beginning in the late 1880s and running all the way until the mid to late 19, 1950s. A great civic mission selling Los Angeles to other people. And we've incorporated selling into our, vi our view of our lives here that makes it sometimes difficult to talk about this place except as a the transaction between buyer and seller. In any case, boosterism in Los Angeles was a made the city the, the best and most advertised consumer product on the planet between the late 1880s and the mid-1950s, late 1950s. And don't you think it is now with Hollywood? Oh, well, you know, Hollywood markets a rather peculiar view of, of Los Angeles oh, right now. Oh, I agree, now. Yeah. But, but I mean, certainly it is the ultimate in selling Los Angeles to the But it's the rest a dark vision. He, he, it's a dark vision of criminals true. and yeah. gangsters and... L.A. And Confidential and True Confessions and... Uh, Grand Canyon, and Crash I mean, you name and it. Grand Canyon, you those go are on great, Those are great movies. Disney, just, you know, it's not just movies about I'm L.A. Tell. I'm, I'm yeah, right. okay, I understand. Let's, I mean, the whole industry. Yeah. yeah, let's get Brendan in here. He's now the owner of uh, Huffman Public Affairs. Uh, before, used to work for the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, and before that, the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. In terms of uh, the uh, Hilton Hotels has announced that they're moving their world headquarters from L.A. or Beverly Hills specifically to Virginia. Um, they're not taking the Hilton building here, so don't worry about that uh, for those of you who are business majors here. The uh, L.A. Times Closed. used to be headquartered here, but the LA Times is actually now headquartered in Chicago, and we can go on and on about the number of, yeah, it is true, the number of corporations that used to exist in Los Angeles. What is happening to... Wait, wait, wait. Explain to them why the I'm, LA Times is headquartered in Chicago. I'm going to have Brendan explain I, that. I heard a gasp. Yeah. So, Brendan, why is the LA Times headquartered in Chicago? Why is the Hilton leaving us? Why do we continuously lose we, I, I can't think, we only have two Fortune 100 companies headquartered in L.A., okay? North, sounds, go yeah, ahead. That, that sounds about right. There are four Fortune 500 companies headquartered in the city of Los Angeles, and I believe the city of El Segundo has more Fortune 500 companies than the city of L.A. I think there are a total of nine or ten in L.A. County. But California, and L.A. County in particular, used to have, this used to be the center of business for the entire West Coast. The business climate has suffered in the last few years. And I want to give you a couple uh, interesting statistics that I've come across in my, um, in my career as, as a lobbyist and small business advocate. And prior to uh, being involved with lobbying, I worked for the State Assembly for seven years uh, during the 90s. But you're not one of those lobbyists that was hired by different people. You work for business when you say yeah. lobbying. Yeah, I was a registered lobbyist for the business groups that I used to work for speaking for the business community as a whole, or at least trying to. The, the fun thing about LA, and I'm a third generation Angelino, is its diversity. And, and just back to the media, uh, the newspaper discussion for a second, it's really hard to cover Los Angeles. LA County has over 10 million people. It's the most diverse uh, area in the entire world, which makes it a fun place to live, a vibrant place to live. It helps our economy as we do business with every country on the planet through Los Angeles, but um, it's also hard to communicate with everyone. We have so many languages spoken, uh, not just in the county, but in, in our public schools. So it's, sometimes it's hard uh, for newspapers and other media outlets to connect, as well as elected officials. Back to our business climate. 
Um, a lot of it has to do with what goes on in Sacramento. Um, there are a lot of stats out there from various business groups and think tanks saying that we're, we have the highest taxes in the country, uh, we have the highest workers' comp rates in the country, we have the highest health care cost, we have the most stringent labor rules, environmental rules, um, and that discourages a lot of business. I grew up uh, not far from LMU um, in West LA. When, as a child, whenever we drove to the Valley, which is about once or twice a year, I would get car sick. I was born in 1970, by the way. But now I live there. I've lived there for five years, and the air quality is so much better, although the population has tripled, almost tripled in my lifetime. Why is that? A lot of it has to do with the cars are cleaner, the fuel is cleaner, and that's a tribute to environmental rules and uh, pressure on Detroit to make more fuel efficient and um, uh, better, uh, less emitting vehicles. But a lot of it has to do with our factories leaving uh, due to environmental pressures, due to to other realities. <coughs> the unfortunate part about those factories leaving is that those were our middle class jobs. You know, and I meet a lot of people who are retired, uh, living on pensions for companies that moved out of the valley a long time ago. Where did they go? So you're saying that companies left because of government regulation, not because uh, it was cheaper to move to a foreign country? It's a combination of a lot of things. It's cheaper to operate in another state and sometimes another country because they don't have the environmental well, like, regulations. What's a concrete example of a specific company that we know left because of regulation, because of taxes, not because it was cheaper in terms of labor or, or it was easier to move to a different country where they had more resources for the manufacturing that they were doing? These are a lot of the medium-sized manufacturers that are not publicly traded, but you know, had a workforce of one or 200 people. They might still be headquartered in LA, but they move the jobs to Alabama, Idaho, Mexico, Taiwan, Korea. The film industry is a great example of jobs that have gone to Asia. Uh, shows like The Simpsons are uh, largely pr uh, produced or manufactured in, in Korea, and they actually make a lot of jokes about that during the program. Um, now they've escaped me. I just want to connect with the audience yeah. there, Fernando. Thank, thanks for indulging me. So that's unfortunate. But the city of LA um, also has some issues that make it harder for, for businesses in LA to, to prosper. The city of LA has very high business taxes. They're among the highest of any large city in America. The city of Burbank has no business tax. So when Yahoo was uh, about four or five years ago shopping for a city to move several hundred jobs, uh, they came to the city of LA and said, you know, we're interested in coming to LA, and by the way, Burbank, um, this is what we'd pay in rent in Burbank, right by the airport. This is the business tax, and this is utility tax. Can you give us a deal? And the city could not. I think part of it has to do with uh, the lack of attention by public officials and elected officials on how to recruit business back. Uh, the business team is something that uh, Mayor Reardon started in the 90s, and some of the, the best, he had such a talented business team. A lot of people you meet um, uh, who, who uh, are, are developers and build you know, some of the new buildings we want that provide the jobs we're trying to attract came out of that business team. But all too often, um, our, our city fails us. The LA Chamber did something very interesting about a year and a half ago. They had someone on staff, I won't say who, uh, call the business team and say, yeah, I'm a manufacturer in Nevada, I'd like to... Uh, Thinking of moving to LA, I have 40 jobs and I'm looking for this kind of space, please give me a call back. No one called. They called two more times, no one ever called back. If you call the city manager in Santa Clarita or Burbank or El Segundo, <laughs> the city manager is going to call you right back and probably the mayor. And one of my dream jobs, I've decided, um, is to run the Santa Clarita Chamber of Commerce or the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce. Because That's really moving up from LA Chamber to Santa Clarita Chamber. Because they're on the phone every, those, those execs are on the phone every day with the city manager and, uh, and, and often the mayor and city council members. Well, why would you call anybody in city government in LA? Wouldn't you call Latham Watkins and the high powered lobbyists and well, start throwing money around and buying into the game so that they get to the politicians who tell the bureaucrats what to do? And that's how you get something done. L.A. Live and the wow, Staples. Wow, he just in one sentence gave my whole class for the whole year. So it's like. <laughs> L.A. Live and Staples Center are the worst in, uh, examples of a city for sale. 
Tim Lewicki from, a, uh, from, from Ann Schutz Entertainment Group, this Denver billionaire, came in here and thought he had a nice little sweetheart deal. He had a plan. They were going to give him land. They were going to trade it. And then it blew up because he hadn't paid off the right people. And a few people went after it, and they rejiggered the deal. And he came back, and he talked about it publicly. I don't, I don't remember reading that in the Daily News. Did you guys cover it that way? Uh, Not quite like oh, that. Okay. No. You got, you got, who's been to uh, L.A. Live? Uh, Staples Center. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> this is what he's talking about. Th those things are paid for by you, by all of us, in huge and massive subsidies to, to provide billionaire um, with more wealth, to create well, well, something let, that... Let's ask the former councilwoman who voted for this. Yeah, go on, Ruth. <laughs> explain how yeah, we got you, you, right. voted for, you voted in favor wait, of this. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. I want to back up a step here. Because I think Brendan said something that's very important that I don't want you guys to miss. He referred a number of times to how if you want to go to Burbank or Long Beach, you would call the city manager. And I want to point out to you that one of the interesting things about the city of Los Angeles, and I believe it's part of the problem of the city of Los Angeles, is we don't have a city manager. Most cities are run by a mayor and a council who, who set policy and get elected and do all this stuff and go out and campaign and pander to whoever is going to vote. Um, but they have somebody in charge of actually managing the government, managing the budget, managing the department heads, making sure that this department is getting everything it needs, the money isn't all going to that department. That's a city manager. City of Los Angeles has no such thing. So are you well, in favor of a city manager? I am in favor of a city manager. I had a long could argument. just have a real mayor, but that would be a different Well, approach. I'll tell you why I don't think that would work. Here's why I don't think it would work. The skills to get elected are not the same as the skills to run a large corporation. That's very important. I think Re that's repeat really that important. I will happily repeat it. I learned it the hard way, as, as first as a candidate and then as somebody actually in charge of getting things done. I happen to be better at getting things done than I am at being a campaigner. But most people who run for office are much better at being campaigners than they are at actually managing something. And they, trust me, these are not the same skills. If you can find somebody who can do both, that's the person you want to elect. So JD, though, it, it seems a little unfair to compare the city of Los DJ, Angeles. DJ. DJ. I'm oh, sorry, DJ. So four million people in the city of LA. In Lakewood, it's not even 100,000. It's 83,000. 83,000, okay? So in and there's a city manager. And there's and a, there's been a city point. manager. There's a city manager, a part-time council that gets yeah, paid city council. $100 a month. Yeah, Ruth, Ruth used to month. get paid 100 a night. Well, they, I did not. They raised the salary a whole bunch of times after, after left? I left. So, okay. <laughs> but is it now 180,000? I think it's 180 or 190. No, now, it's 190. How okay. much did you get paid? Uh, at the end, 140. When I started, it oh. was 60. And let me tell you why they get paid 190. Okay. Because this is another thing you want to. As it's a question for DJ, but go ahead. As, I'm sorry. No, please. As, as voters, should you? How many of you are, are live in the city of LA? Okay. They and don't know. They probably live in El Segundo. No, 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 no. Oh, oh no. They no. know. No, they don't. I just did well, this. We did this in class. Okay, they'll find out. Well, where's Alexis? Okay. <laughs> Okay, they'll find. She, insi she insisted she lived in the city of LA, even though she lives in Santa Monica. And and residents of Lakewood call Lakewood City Hall asking to speak to Mayor Villaraigosa all the time. Is that they right? do every week. See, he's okay. a mayor so, for everyone. Now wait a minute. Now I'm going to tell you why the city council gets paid a ridiculous amount of money, considering that not one of them these days is actually governing anything. In I've forgotten the year. The, um, w when Mayor Bradley was still the mayor, all right, this is the question I've been dying to ask since I first was approached about coming here. Is there anybody here who was born in by 1987? No. Well, okay. A few. 87. Well, 87. So, Ruth, anybody inco incoming older? freshmen were born in 1990. These are mostly juniors and seniors. There you go. All right. So maybe, they, maybe we made it to 87. Okay, 1987 is when I started on the council. I hate it when I discover that all the people I'm talking to a are born rare case later. where she actually beat an incumbent, which I is did. almost unheard. The president of the, the president council. The president of the council. Yes, Absolutely. it was actually quite a story. We can come back to that. Quite a story. Tom Bradley, who was probably the most successful mayor L.A. ever had, was the mayor at that point. He was elected in 1973, Three. Three. shortly before I moved here. Well, 
notice you know so shortly you were, after you, I, so no, no, you were no, raised in la I, no i was raised in new york so you were Don't a, car sound you're like a carpet a bagger i'm a carpet bagger okay, you got like, it no. like like three quarters of the people here um but you know i tried to get somebody to make me a carpet bag and i couldn't I couldn't get anybody to find me one. Uh, all right, wait a minute. I am going to tell this story no matter what. Out of LA. Quiet. I'm telling this story. DJ, I'm, I, I'm just a local government bureaucrat here. <laughs> don't you don't you want to know why they're paid all this money? Yes. Tom Bradley, toward the end of his tenure, the LA Times, and I mean, you guys probably did it too, but the LA Times discovered that Tom Bradley was serving as a member of the board of directors of a bank, and he was being paid to serve on this board of directors, as were all the other board members. Uh, but he had encouraged the city to deposit its money in a bank where he was on the board of directors. This is kind of a no-no. And when he got caught, he did, this is, a, this is a really smart politician. Instead of doing any kind of mea culpa like these guys who have been failing to pay their taxes, National. he said, I am going to become the ethics mayor. And he set up a blue ribbon committee on ethics. And the blue ribbon committee got so excited about the chance to do ethics reform that they came up with a very elaborate proposal. I am the only person in city government who read every word of every draft of the stuff they put together. And I will spare you the critique, but I didn't like it. Um, is not, City Hall more corrupt today than it was back then? I believe it is. Yeah, I believe it's a and, certainty. And I, which is one of the reasons I didn't like the whole ethics proposal. So the ethics proposal was going to have to go on the ballot because it amends the city charter. And the city charter, which is like the Constitution, can only be amended by popular vote. The head of the Blue Ribbon Commission, a gentleman named Jeffrey Cowan, who is uh, went on to be a professor at USC School of Journalism and has since retired from that. Uh, he couldn't get hired here, so he had to settle for SC. He was at SC. He was at SC for years. I knew him when he was at law school. But he, uh, he was then president of California Common Cause, and he was in charge of the ethics. And he needed to get this on the ballot. He figured out that to get it on the ballot, you have to get a certain number of signatures. To pay to get all those signatures, he'd have to go raise something like $300,000. So he did something smarter than that. He went to Councilman John Ferraro, the president of the council, and he said, look, John, I want to get this on the ballot. And the way to get it on the ballot without my having to raise $300,000 is for the city council to put it on the ballot. The city council's price for putting it on the ballot was to have the charter amendment address a problem they'd had in the past, which was they had to vote for their own raises. And every time they voted themselves a raise, the public went bonkers over the whole thing. Ron would have had a field day. We had a lot of fun. I'm sure you did. <laughs> so in order to, um, they, they cloaked this in the concept of elevated ethics reform, and they said, we're going to take this away, for, we're going to take the politics out of the sell, setting of city salaries. And they so, did. So the charter reform measure said that the salaries of the city council members will be whatever a judge gets. And then the mayor gets, the controller and the city attorney get 10% more and the mayor gets 20% more. So I'm happy to tell you that I wrote the ballot argument against ethics reform. <laughs> I am very proud of this. Should My be. staff was scandalized. They said, you can't be against ethics reform. I said, watch. But I lost. I mean, it passed overwhelmingly because the League of Women Voters and California Common Cause, which everybody knows are for good government, said, oh, this is wonderful. We're going to have ethics reform. So that set up the salary scale. Now, it's easy to find people um, to run for council who've never made that much money in their lives. I certainly had never made that it's much money. It's only 12 or 13 of the 15, I think, at never least, made that much at money least. in their lives. Um, hey, wait a minute. They're, wait, 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 wait. And then, but... <laughs> Whose but, show is this anyway? Go, go ahead. Sorry. You, you, no, no, go, go, You go, gave go, me go. the You're, chance. You should ne yeah. never put a microphone in front of a politician. The, um, so, but it's much harder to get good judges to stay as judges because judges can make, lawyers can make a lot more money being hotshot lawyers working for a law firm or being a lobbyist then judges get paid. So in order to keep enough judges, California keeps raising the salary of the judges. And every time the judge's salary goes up, so do the LA city officials.
but they are responsible for four million people, billions of billions of dollars of budget. Yeah. The, our public safety in terms of the police department, fire department, paramedics, et cetera, they should be paid well. It relatively speaking, 190000 Well, we always talk about government working like the private sector. For anybody who was in charge of that large of a corporation, they're underpaid. Yeah, but these guys get four years There's guaranteed employment. There's a couple of gals on too. And I, I, I've always advocated that every two years when the municipal elections come up, that voters have a choice of what they should be paid for the work they've done. 10,000, 20,000. Do you know it would be zero? I mean, you know it'd be, it would be Well, uh, if it's zero, then it would be a message that you're not worth a darn. No, it'd be a, it, <laughs> it would be a message that people are cheap and they don't want to pay for something. I mean, well, Ron, people are you know, paying you know through the nose for this government that isn't solving any of their problems. We still have the worst air. We have the worst traffic congestion. We have the worst gang problem. You can go through the list and it's hard to think of anything that's better um, in the last 10 or 15 years. Water conservation. Water conservation and solar energy is another one of those and things. And recycling. We're talk about all that my stuff here. That. We'll get to the uh, lobbyist and the extended terms. Oh, on and solar, all the rest. yes, we will. It's DJ's. I turn. had a very different vision of this. Right. I had a very different we'll vision of this panel. See, I thought that I would ask the questions, they, these three would answer, and then DJ would reflect and all that. But it's obviously <laughs> not going that way. Um, I have two specific questions for Brendan then get a response from Ron and Ruth, and then DJ is going to uh, put it into context, <laughs> okay? So, I'll be quiet. All right? So, it's Brendan, okay, we've heard Ron talk about lobbyists, okay? You were a registered lobbyist on behalf of the business community, okay? I also have to make an argument that the business community has, for a long time, was not very well organized, and it's not until really Reardon came back and and started improving the uh, Chamber of Commerce that it started to find its voice again. That's just an opinion. I would like you to reflect on that. Give me a specific case when you went in to lobby Council Member Ruth Galanter and she voted against you, okay? And then, Ron, how did you guys cover that particular issue? And then, <laughs> DJ, put it into context for the students. Brendan, your turn. In this case, I don't think Ruth ever voted against me, but what I do remember about being in her office, she had this great picture of Kermit the Frog who had come to council chambers posing with Ruth. She also had um, an article. Oh, so Kermit the Frog visited you? I, I, that no, it's, it's Dave Freeman from Water and Power gave me a little oh. Kermit the and when I found out how much money you made, I thought, wow, 90000 and Kermit the Frog, I got to run for office one day. Um, she also had a great LA Times piece. Uh, Sam Yorty uh, had pledged in 1969 that Angelinos would never have to separate their garbage or recycle. Um, I still have it. Yeah, that, I love it. Uh, so <coughs> I, don't, I don't think I was, I don't think Ruth was on the council when we, uh, when I, went to her, the chamber went to her. But there are cases, well, there are unfortunately a lot of cases, where council members have voted against uh, the chamber. I'll use one example. Uh, I was working at VICA, and this was r recent history, and many of you um, probably remember it. Some of you might have been involved in it. Uh, the Century Boulevard hotels were pressured by uh, County Federation of Labor and the Hotel Workers Union to start paying a living wage, um, which is 11 or $12, depending if you provide benefits or not. And that has to do with an organizing uh, tactic um, uh, for the, the hotel workers wanted to use. So they went to the city council, which had never gotten involved with wage issues before, and asked them to create um, a higher minimum wage for hotels on Century Boulevard. And they used the argument that the city had jurisdiction to do that, the city council that is, because these hotels were um, in business due to the proximity of a city-owned airport, LAX. But that is true. It, it is true. Okay. But Just that wondering. doesn't, but there are also hotels in no, Culver City and El Segundo. Yeah. But the question becomes, well, I'll get to the, what the question became. Um, so the, the business community was very uh, distraught about this because cities are usually not setting wages. Um, and there were some political issues between the unions and some of the hotel operators, who I'm not going to apologize for um, at, at this debate. 
So we went to several council members who were uh, sympathetic to our arguments, and they said, well, I talked to a lawyer, and he said the city of Berkeley was able to do it on, at their hotel, and the argument there that our response is, well, that hotel is on city property. A city, if a city wants to set a higher wage, it's a condition of you vending for the city, contracting with the city, or doing business on city property, um, that's their prerogative. But this is private property, this is private employers. Um, anyway, business folks were brought into a meeting in the mayor's office with folks from labor, and um, the compromise was worse than, uh, than the original. Oh, you guys are great negotiators. I, I'll tell you, I was invited to be in the room, and um, I suggested they bring in someone of a higher stature than me um, and had more influence, and I regret that I hadn't been in that room because um, I thought it would have been interesting to see. In any event, um, it's been through court, and now the hotels are uh, paying, paying a higher wage, and I think one of the hotels um, is, is on the road to being a union. But one of the interesting things about the ordinance was that- And I'm gonna ask it, Ruth how she would have voted on it. That. It exempted um, hotels that were already union. So clearly it was an organizing tool for the unions, very smart on their part, but the business community, um, due to probably two or three decades of, of, not, uh, of ceasing their influence at City Hall, was not able to find more than two votes on the 15-member city council to defeat it. Not only that, we, when we got our foot in the door, <laughs> we, wa we walked out with a compromise that was worse than the original, the, the original deal. So th there are council members who um, I've worked with very closely since then, and interestingly enough, they're, for the most part, they're all pretty nice people, and we get along. And well, we wouldn't good, you be nice if you made $190,000? Well, now it's up to one eighty. dollars Wow, okay. So, but, Ruth, how did you vote on this? And then, Ron, how did you guys cover it, and why is the business community so inept vis-a-vis -vis unions in, in City Hall? And then we'll get to um, DJ. Okay, I was already off the council by that time. Yeah, but how would you but have voted? In, in case my center, well, I have mixed feelings about it. My mixed feelings. Oh, you had to vote yes or no. There's no like mixed I, I'm, feeling. I'm coming to that. I'm no. going to I'm going to fess up right away. I was the uh, I was asked by the organizing committee to chair because I was a former council member to chair a committee they put together to essentially do a report to justify the ordinance, and I did it. So I, I was the chair of a blue ribbon committee that we created to study the working conditions in the hotels on Century Boulevard. If that's not clear enough, I would have supported it. But here's my reluctance. My reluctance about this, I used to also used to be on the Coastal Commission before I was on the City Council. And my concern about it was I, I, I am still troubled that hotels who are not in a specific area, get off the hook. It seems to me that the, the real issue here, and I never understood why the business community was so <coughs> unhappy about paying workers enough money so that the workers were happy so that they would presumably do their jobs better. I mean, we have a fundamental disagreement here. And I think that the business community probably did not handle that one as well as they might have, which only reinforces what you were saying at the beginning. There, there's two issues here. One is who's right and who's wrong, and the other one is how much influence do you have regardless of whether you're right or wrong. And I, I think your point was um, mainly that the business community ought to have more influence regardless of whether they're right or wrong because you're assuming they were right on this one. No, not necessarily, so let me comment on that. Please do. Had, had I been in the room, in the mayor's office that day, I would have suggested, and I did suggest to several council members involved, another path. Um, I think the hotel operators had uh, their own strategy and the business community at large had a slightly different strategy. Um, I can't speak for everyone, I can only speak for myself, and when I've had people work for me, I paid them as much as I possibly could, and very few people who worked under me left um, to work somewhere else. In fact, I took a pretty low salary, not a pretty low, but a much lower salary at my previous job than my predecessor so that there was money to retain staff and actually grow it. But, back, but this isn't about me. Back to, uh, back to the hotel. My, what I suggested is why don't we take advantage of having a very high business tax rate for hotels in the city of LA and any hotel that pays a living wage and provides benefits would pay a much reduced business tax to the city of LA. Now, you know, on paper, that sounds like a good idea. The reason why council members said they wouldn't go for it is because, well, 
labor really sees this as a tool to get more of their members and put more pressure. So like I said, this was a union organizing tool in addition to trying to help, help people make a little bit more money and get benefits for themselves and their families. So, uh, you know, that, that just shows an example of the, the, the strength of labor in the city of LA, sometimes an unwillingness to, to compromise, as well as a lack of leadership at City Hall to bring sides together. But also shows an ineptitude sometimes of the business community for agreeing to a compromise that was worse than the original. Right. So, um, full disclosure, about while this is all going on, about 300 students from Loyola Marymount University uh, marched from the flagpole down Loyola Boulevard all the way to the uh, Century City Hotels in support of the uh, hotel workers. Ron, why is business so inept vis-a-vis -vis labor unions? And then, DJ, talk about the emergence of labor in, in Los Angeles. All right. I'll let DJ explain the history, but this is Chinatown, Jake. And, and the history is there have never been strong democratic institutions. It was run by a small clique of business-oriented, extremely conservative people. With the election, just before the election of Tom Bradley, you got the first labor union, the IBEW. They were legalized public employees unions. And, and Tom Bradley's election created an energy. My view is, is that they've engaged increasingly in, in a failed experiment in municipal socialism. Now, that's an oxymoron. You can't have socialism in a city. You can have it in a country or a vast region. And, and what they've done is to play politics. The business community, they, they, we're giving eight, taking $8, seven, $8 an hour workers and giving them 10. That don't make you middle class. But that helps. I mean, but that have, helps I'd relieve your 10. pain, but who's paying for it? And where does the money come from? And how come all the jobs from 15 to $30 an hour have either fled, have fled to the suburbs, have fled across the country? And it goes to public policy that, that used the poor, encouraged poverty, followed policies that ran down neighborhoods. The Valley was the largest enclave of middle class people in America 20 years ago. In the 90s, there was a 50% increase in poverty. Good jobs left, neighborhoods were run down, police services declined. I mean, these all flow out of public policy. San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle of expenses, very expensive cities, are flourishing. Flourishing because they've maintained the quality of life in their cities because they've made them attractive places to live, to have good jobs, to, to have good employment and good economic opportunity. LA has gone the opposite direction of exploiting the poor to create a political base and, and using the, the very tepid media that is, is, has not engaged the subject and gone to war against the middle class exploited them, driven up the costs of being middle class to the point that you can go into any middle class neighborhood in this city and people have been around a long time have reached the point where they are seriously wondering why they're still here when all they do is get the bill and they don't get the good services and the quality of life. I'll let DJ explain. DJ, is, is uh, Ron a Republican, a Libertarian? Uh, I'm a an angry man. He, crotchety old guy. I mean, how would you label him politically? An angry man. That's, um, that's, the, uh, that's the fundamental American political party. <laughs> that's, um, that's, the, that's the basic American political party, is, is the angry individual. Um, by golly, it would be impossible to weave together all that we've heard in the last uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, in, in, and give it a, 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 its full justice in some, some sort of historical context. Let me just hit upon a couple of themes here that might, uh, might get the ball rolling a bit, uh, bit more. One of the questions you might ask yourselves as students of, uh, trying to understand Los Angeles, why are we talking about the powerlessness of the business community? Isn't in the Mother Goose version of civic life, the business community, always the, 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 the bete noir, the, 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 the evil uh, genius behind all of, the, uh, all of the political problems in a place? Why are business people so powerless? And that's an interesting question that needs to be answered by how it is that a very small number of highly connected lobbyists, consultants, and construction contractors have become the, which are not the business community in any sense, have become the motivators of political life in, in Los Angeles. That's question one. Question two is we, we're talking about how government provides the services it 
provides the services it provides and how it's possible to, to, to provide them at a level that makes you and me feel comfortable. Um, it's an old, cranky complaint on the part of uh, local government types, and I uh, confess to being uh, your representative of local government here, um, but I can point a shaky finger at, at decisions that your grandparents made, probably, to vote in favor of Proposition 13. Now, that, that is a, the third rail of California politics, but we have to talk about how government provides the services that make your life better, and one of the problems that every city c confronts, and my city, as much as Los Angeles confronts, is where do we get the dollars to do that? And in Los Angeles, they e made... DJ, tell them uh, Proposition 13 was proposition passed 13 10 was, years before most of these kids yeah, were born. Proposition 13 was passed in 1978, and it, and it essentially uncoupled the provision of local services, municipal services, to you from, from property taxes. You, in, in, in essence, uh, what, there used to be a nexus between owning property and paying, paying uh, property tax that purchased the services that made middle class life uh, tolerable. And the value of that property. And the value of that property. Very, very specifically, your property tax from your home went to your local schools, your local college district, your local city. And what part of what happened there was that uh, the, the level of property tax levied against your property was based upon how long you had owned it. And so entities that owned property and rarely sold it continually had, had a much lower uh, a property tax. And people buying houses and the prop property was sold and sold, they ended up paying higher property taxes. That's, that's a, a long argument we could have there. Um, and I think Ruth is also pointed us in the direction of, of, of questioning how the structure of government in Los Angeles, that wacko, even after charter reform, that wacko charter that the city of Los Angeles struggles with, has deformed um, the political process in the city of Los Angeles. A charter that was adopted in the, in the mid-1920s, designed specifically to uh, enshrine the permanent power of unelected technocrats within each uh, city department, and to make elected officials window dressing for the decision making that they made. And even after charter reform in the, in the late 1990s, we still have a system of government in Los Angeles that is difficult to understand, uh, uh, cranky, and, and, um, and uh, crippled, if you'll allow me that word, in its attempts to make it more accountable and in some sense more democratic with a small d. Uh, those are just uh, some quick reactions to what I've been hearing so far. So. You know, you know, my Go ahead, Ron, and then I'm going to ask Ruth a question one, about one her point. election. The, the, the history that I, I tell is, is a history of six families that ran the town that became the Committee of 25 and that I call the Committee of 225. Um, it's always been narrowly held. People came here to have a good time, to be beautiful, to get rich, to party, um, and paid very, very little attention. Life was good. You're ta he's talking about Loyola Marymount University or LA? I think it's all of LA. I mean, this is a great place, man. It's just a rotten city, and that's why we have to take it back. And democratic institutions did not even begin to grow until the first beginnings was Prop 13, and it slowly took off. Neighborhood councils are chaotic and crazy. I mean, I go to these meetings, man, and I don't know how people endure it at most of them. Uh, you know, there's little petty people bossing everybody around and never talking about anything significant, certainly never having decisions. But nonetheless, thousands of people are involved. Homeowners groups are involved. And a political force is growing out of the ground of Los Angeles that the system thinks it can beat. And they probably can, but I'm out there and it's growing and it's real. And, and we'll see if, if some change doesn't come from that. So there was no countervailing power and that's why contractors and lobbyists and developers moved in. And the general business community was, was, Hollywood doesn't give a damn about this city. I mean, it wasn't important to them ever. Um, they didn't even need to buy the politicians. All they had to do was take them to parties with beautiful starlets and they could get anything they wanted. Um, uh, and so you have a system that's dysfunctional, owned and controlled by narrow interests, that's, that has, uh, uh, nobody's in charge. Would you say, I mean, who runs the system? It, the, who ran the system in the past were those that, that Ron described. Today, the, the, the 
the, with a little bit of charter reform, there's a, there's a yeasty um, a fermenting, uh, something happening in the undergrowth, and it, it, I, I'm eager to see what will happen next in the, in the next eight to 10, 12 years if we can all survive together. Uh, but there is a different city, uh, a morning in Los Angeles, and, and although I understand Ron's uh, focus on the valley, as I am focused on my little corner of the southeast part of LA County in Lakewood, I have to say that part of what that city that's coming uh, is also uh, a city that looks way different from the one that, that Ron or Ruth encountered when they first arrived in Los Angeles. It's a much different kind of city. I'm an LA guy now, DJ. Yeah, and that's right. So and and he, I, I, would, I would say that, that there's, a, a, apart from all of the political uh, commentary you've heard this evening and apart from all of the cr criticism of how a government is uh, framed in Los Angeles, what interests me most is how this process of mestizaje is underway in Los Angeles and what kind of hybrid people we will become as a consequence of it. And it may make for wonderful politics or it may make for terrible politics, but it is that almost overwhelms everything, I th everything we can say about Los Angeles on occasion. So DJ and Ron were just talking about this kind of postmodern abstract LA that is emerging. Let me get back to a real concrete event, 1987. Uh, Ruth Galanter lives in Venice and wants to become the council member of the 6th district. We now live in the 11th district, but that's a different story. Uh, in the 6th district is a councilwoman named Pat Russell, probably the most powerful uh, council member at that time. And Ruth was this uh, coastal commission, environmental radical that uh, no one gave a chance to uh, winning. And uh, so well, why did you think you were going to win? I mean, you, you had no money. Nobody knew who you were. You were running against the most powerful councilwoman. What's the deal? Well, when I first started running, I, I, let, me, let me start by saying something that happened later, and then we'll put it in the okay. context. The nicest thing anybody ever said about me, from my point of view, my, about my council tenure, was actually said about me by a business leader, David Fleming, uh, with whom I was not aware I had any point of agreement whatsoever. But um, I have actually represented in my 16 years on the council, they kept moving my district around, and I have represented more different parts of the city than anybody else who wasn't elected to citywide office. You were such a pain in the ass to them, you wound up in the valley. That's right, and then, and then I had you to deal with. Hey, we became another friends. Whole, another, yeah, but not in public. <laughs> <laughs> he would never say anything nice about me in public. All right, never mind. Never mind. The, the, what David Fleming said about me when I was moved to the valley, I finished my career representing the Northeast San Fernando Valley, <coughs> a district that was 71% Latino and very poor. And really, it was in. It was but very. But you never ran in that district. I you did not have to run in there. that district. But you it also was, did a great job. It was. Thank people, you. I'll tell it you was. That. It was a very interesting experience because those people really needed my help, and the people I represented on the west side for all the traffic is terrible and all that stuff. Basically, on the west side, we live a pretty good life. So you're calling them whiners? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I call them a lot worse than that sometimes. Actually, my favorite phrase for it, if this is okay on television, is the IGAMFI, which stands for I've got mine, I'll leave you to do the F part yourself. I've got mine, everybody else. I can't figure that out, but go ahead. You can figure it out. <laughs> Come on. All right. So in 1987, here I am. Uh, Actually, so what David Fleming said about me yeah, was, was... This he is watched, the longest he, story for one point. Yeah, well, you keep <laughs> interrupting me. He said, he said, I've been watching this woman for 15 years. She's different from the rest of them. I was about to walk over and put my arms around him, and he went on. He said, she didn't run for office to be somebody. She ran for office to get things done. And every time I think about that, I choke up because I had no idea he had noticed. I really did run. Uh, this was something very different from what is currently fashionable. I, w I had never thought of running for elective office, but I was very upset about the councilwoman's position with respect to the wetlands down at the bottom of the hill here. 
and which she, in which she and Mayor Bradley were supporting an enormous amount of development that would have basically destroyed the wetlands. The original Playa Vista. Idea. The original Playa Vista after Howard Hughes died. This is one day I'm going to write a book about this. We're going to skip the story for the moment. But the, I could think of nothing else to do but run for office and challenge this woman. And so I ran. Now, realistically. Did you think you were going to win? You know, I did. When I first started, I didn't. If I really thought I was going to run, I would never have going to win. I would never have done it. I had no idea what wait, wait, I was wait. in if for. If you really thought you were going to win, you never would have run. I probably would have been afraid to run. But I started running because I thought I'll throw a good scare into her, and then she'll change her policies on the wetlands, and everything will be cool. And then I'll go on and put my life together. But early in the campaign, it began to dawn on me that I was going to win. And the, it's it's. Uh, no credit to me, the real reason that I won is that she lost. And the real reason that she lost is that she had supported the construction of a very large building on Sepulveda Boulevard. You're probably familiar with this building. It's, it's this big, it's actually not a bad looking building, but it's very big. Big, um, I don't know what it is now, it was called the Wang Building. It's a Howard Hughes Promenade, you guys know it as the bridge. The, yeah, yeah, but right it's, it's the, the big building up the hill from She there. was against that. So that building went up, and you can see that. I was campaigning on top of the bluff across the Pulvita Boulevard, and every, between every house, you'd see this thing looming up over the bluff. Well, when that building went up, Mrs. Russell lost Westchester. They were not going to vote for her. All I had to do was distinguish myself from all the other people running against her. And that was not very difficult because I was the only one with any political experience at all. Um, so people were, that's an example of a situation where people were ready for change and they had somebody to vote for. And I believe that it is not impossible to defeat incumbents, <coughs> but what you have to have among other things, is a plausible opposition candidate. And those are getting harder and harder to find because now most of the people who run for office are people who've spent their whole lives working for some other politician. They're committed, as David Fleming didn't say about me, they're committed to being important. They're much less committed to a specific platform. And even the ones who sound pretty good in the campaign about a platform, when they get in office, they're for whatever the person in front of them is, is for. And it's very hard to find committed leaders who are willing, not, first of all, to run for office, which is, which is really hard work, especially the campaigning part. Has there ever been anybody since you who came from the ground, the grassroots, from the community? Well, if you ask them, they would say yes. Well, but I don't think so. I think they've all been involved in the system in one way or another. I can't think. Laura Chick was a staff aide. I mean, I, I can't think of anybody. Let me think about it. I mean, Rosendahl would claim that he was, no, a, he was you know, but that's a whole different thing. Yeah, a different a, thing. Yeah. So, but we have to talk about one thing. What's that? During the campaign in 1987, you came out of nowhere. And the sense from those that cover politics like journalists and those who observe it like myself and DJ was that you didn't stand a chance. But then something was happening, and it was clear that you were gaining momentum. And it was clear that you were going to force her into a runoff and maybe even win. And then something happened. You want to talk about yeah. that? Uh, what happened was somebody tried to kill me and came very, very close. Um, and that, of course, put me on every newspaper in the country. So as one of my friends said, a friend in San Francisco said, don't you think that was going a little too far to try to win the election? But you know those conspiracy I damn near theories, died. The, a, lot, a lot of people thought, I mean, there were well, some conspiracy theorists that believed that you The had reason I'm alive is that that's what I thought. When the knife was going into my head, I was sure that this was a political crime. And I was so angry <laughs> that I fought back. Um, and uh, I really, I am very lucky to be roots, alive. roots, that's what I'd say. <laughs> so you ended up Gee, in the hospital for... I was in the hospital for 56 days. I won an election from a hospital bed. Um, by the time I got out of the hospital, and was sworn in. I was, I was stabbed on May 6th. The election was on June 2nd. I got out of the hospital on June 30th. I took office on July 1st. By the time I got to 
the council chamber on July 1st, we already had 300 calls from people saying, you see, she's just like all the rest of those people. She hasn't changed a damn thing. <laughs> and it was like that for the and, next six years. And they were years. right. You hadn't changed anything. That's <laughs> right. I didn't have any power, and I was in the hospital. But, but it cuts both ways. I mean, it was, it was a simply awful experience, and it meant that I had to learn my new job at the same time as I, I couldn't speak at the time, actually. And uh, I had to, and that's really hard for a politician. And as you see, I'm still making up for it. <laughs> um, but the, uh, I had to learn a new job, and I had to get healthy at the same time. And I have to say that the council members were very supportive. In, uh, they didn't know anything about me either. But the one thing they did know about me was that uh, and it's really only a small part of my history, but they knew that I had won on an environmental platform. They had no idea what this meant in 1987, not a clue. But they could, one thing every politician can do is count. And they saw that I had won something like 58% of the vote, which is, which is a landslide. What's the decision in, you regret the most? Or vote, you know. Okay. The, the, um, there actually are a number of things I'm proud of. It was a great surprise to me how much I could accomplish. I mean, really, it, it, and the lesson of that is that you shouldn't be afraid of doing this. If there are things you want to get done, having, having electoral power is not a bad way to get them done. I'm particularly proud, my, actually my favorite thing is the toilet law. This is another one that, uh, uh, it's kind of incongruous now, but in, uh, the late 1980s, we didn't know anything about water conservation here. And, and somebody from Mayor Bradley's office dropped in on my office one day and said, you're an environmentalist. How would you like to introduce a motion to require that all new construction be fitted with toilets that use much less water than the normal toilet? I said, fine. He said, here it is. Here's all the material. Do what you want with it. And <clears throat> When I introduced it, first of all, everyone laughed. You're going to be known as the toilet lady. Well, the toilet law, as it turns out, um, saved so much water. The Department of Water and Power caught on pretty quickly how much water they were not going to have to go find because we would be able to make the water we already bring here go that so much further. And so one of the best programs DWP ever did was a program to hire community-based organizations to go out to poor people and offer to replace their old water-guzzling toilet with a new low-water-use toilet. People loved it. They got paid. They were doing an environmentally useful job. These were people who were underemployed or unemployed. The toilets were replaced. We, we wound up in the late 90s, early 2000s, using about the same amount of water we were using 30 years earlier with a 30 percent increase in population. So I'm really proud of that one. Right then. What um, about Mono Lake? What about Mono Lake? I saved it. Yeah. Mono Lake, anybody know Mono Lake? Mono Lake is on the, thank you. Mono Lake is on the east side of the Sierra. Mammoth. Uh, it's, it's just down the hill kind of from Mammoth. Um, it is an inland lake. It is fed by streams that come off the mountain ranges. And the streams over the course of the years, the, the city of Los Angeles had bought up the rights to the streams. And so brought the water from those streams to Los Angeles instead of letting it flow into Mono Lake. As it, Go ahead. As it happens, years before I was on the council, when I worked for the, LA, the California League of Conservation Voters, I shared an office with the Mono Lake Committee. Uh, I had never heard of Mono Lake, but and, they taught me. And we have an exhibit about that in our library right now. If you go down to buy um, the uh, research collection about the photos that we have in our archives from what we call the J.D. Black Papers, which was a very significant family trying to save Mono Lake in the early 30s. So it's, it's a really? great... Uh, See, that's yeah. all. Uh, nobody ever taught me about them. Yeah. So, so what wound up happening was this, went, this fight between the Mono Lake Committee trying to save it and the Department of Water and Power that kept diverting the water went on for 20-something years. And when I came on the council, I felt honor-bound to acknowledge to DWP and to the council that I had shared an office with the Mono Lake Committee. Um, and I kept saying, why are we still litigating? We lose. The Mono Lake Committee wins every time they go to court. Why is the city doing this? 
And each time DWP was convinced they could win and they were wrong. So finally, I got tired of the whole thing and I said, why can't we just settle this? And I was told by a Mona Lake committee person that some years before, one of the commissioners who is now, who's a big, big time environment official, Mary Nichols is now the Air Resources Board person for the second time. Um, Mary Nichols had served on the DWP commission and she had gotten a settlement agreement on the table and then it disappeared. So I said, well, let's get it back. And I called DWP and said, do you still have this and, and would you still support it? And they said, well, we're not sure. And I called the Mono Lake Committee and said, would you still support it? Yeah, we're not sure. I said, okay, let's try this. And I became the Henry Kissinger. Anybody heard of Henry Kissinger? Okay. <laughs> Henry Kissinger was famous for shuttle diplomacy. I did it through my fax machine. I didn't have to budge. I finally figured out this that is the, pre internet. The mistake, yeah, the mistake that we had been making all these years was putting the people in the same room. Typically, what you do when you want to make a deal is you lock them in the room and nobody gets to go to the bathroom till they have a deal. Especially that's, if it's not a low water flow toilet. That's but. how the Coastal Commission, Coastal Act got passed. Jerry Brown locked them all in a, in a room in Sacramento. But it turns out that with Mona Lake, the secret was to never let them in the same room because they hated each other so much. So I finally said, okay, nobody goes near each other. You guys send me a draft, fax it to me. Then I faxed it to Mona Lake Committee. And Martha Davis called me up and she said, listen, this will never work. Let me explain it to you. I said, no, 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 please don't explain it to me. Just cross out what you don't like and write in what you want instead and fax it back. But I got to explain. No, you don't. So she faxed it back. I sent it to DWP and the guy called up right away and he said, this will never work. Let me explain it to you. I said, no, don't explain it. Cross it out. Send it back. <coughs> it took three times back and forth and each side called me up and said, this is okay. And said, initial every page. And then I called the mayor's office and guess, said, guess what, guys? We have a deal. Oh. And, and what is the moral of that story? <laughs> well, there is one. I, I wasn't trying to be ironic or sarcastic, I can assure you. Well, that's my job. That's his job. <laughs> my job is to be historically minded. Uh, moral of that story is, here we have a uh, Los Angeles City Council member negotiating with a department Department of the city, as if it were like Kyrgyzstan or, or you know, Guadalumbia. She that, that that the Department of Water and Power, a department of the city of Los Angeles, had so much power that it could essentially ignore the politics of the city and and for decades engage in a separate, if you will, foreign policy with the people of California and, and, the, and the residents of the Mono Lake and, and the Owens Valley, as, as if they, they stood alone from, from the entire governmental organization of but, the city. But don't you think part of the reason is that nobody on the council knew enough about the issue to be able to step in and say, hold on, fellas. Oh, I'm sure that's part of it. But the other part of it is the sort of the supine quality of politics in, in the city that goes back to the 1920s in which people would say, well, that's the DWP. So just to emphasize DJ's point, What's probably the, the department, the DWP that. probably has a larger budget than the uh, Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan. Well, it was deliberately created as, a, as the engine for the uh, city of Los Angeles growth. It was given enormous statutory and regulatory power in the city of Los Angeles and separated from its political life deliberately so that it, it could continue to do what it was supposed to do, which was so, grow the city. Solar right. panels, first tidbit, Loyola Marymount University has the largest amount of solar panels than any university in the world. Ruth. Another one of my. Uh, okay, well, you want to refine your question here? What is it you want me to? Ta talk to here? us about solar panels, Proposition B. It's going to be on the ballot on March 3rd. Why is it there? What are the politics? Okay. How are you going to vote? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the first thing you want to know, there's a couple of things you want to know about solar power in general. It's a good thing, right? Well, yeah, it depends how you, how and where, and they, here are the things you want to know. Um, the city of Los Angeles, like most other cities in California, is now committed to, as, and the state, now committed to trying to shift the fuel from which we generate electricity from non-renewable fossil fuels like coal and natural gas to renewable fuels like the sun, the wind, and the water. Um, 
we already have in place a very large municipal, publicly owned, municipally owned utility and a structure that brings us power at comparatively low rates. But most of it is generated from fossil fuels. So everybody, now that environment is a popular topic, everybody is in favor of shifting to renewable fuels and the mayor and the council have instructed the Department of Water and Power and the Department of Water and Power has signed on to the notion that they are going to try to reach that at least 20 percent of the power they deliver to us will be generated by renewable fuels, from renewable fuels by whatever year it is this week. Um, so that's the first thing you want to know. Switching to renewable fuels in general, in principle, all other things being equal, is an excellent thing to do. The thing nobody tells you is that we have a system already in place that we've already paid for. And one of the questions is, should we abandon a system that we already own and is already paid for in order to invest a bunch of money in a system that we haven't paid for? And there are arguments on both sides of that, but that is an important question that rarely gets discussed. The reason our power is comparatively inexpensive is that we've already paid off the infrastructure to provide it. So it's like you bought a car and you paid it, now you own the car after having made the payments. That's what you're talking about. Well, let me give you an example with a refrigerator, which is an issue I'm dealing with. I'm remodeling my house. I could probably buy a I new... I would suggest you buy a refrigerator. It's a I good have idea. a refrigerator. Okay. Thank you very much. The, the issue that... Here's the basic simple example. I could probably buy a new refrigerator that would use less juice than the refrigerator I have. But I already have one. If I buy a new one, I have to shell out money for a new one and I have to dispose of the old one. If I use the one I've got until it breaks down, I don't have to buy a new one. I've already paid for the old one and I don't have to dispose of it. It's not going to a landfill. This is a similar thing to the, okay. Next thing you want to know about solar power is that it is actually more cost effective to generate the solar power all in one place in a giant solar farm and then use a transmission line to transmit the power to all the different houses where it's going to wind up and offices. Then it is, it's cheaper to do it that way than it is to have a different solar installation on every roof. Even though intuitively the sun's beating down on your roof anyway, so it make, you think it makes sense. So that's another thing. Now, what are we dealing with on the ballot? We are dealing with, and Ron, I'm sure we'll go on, on more on the oh, same the, vein. The 50 articles I've written in the yeah, last exactly. two months, is, it's not a preoccupation <laughs> at all. <laughs> the, the solar, here's the problem that I think both of us have with this. The proposition that is on the ballot, that's coming on the ballot, was, was generated, you should pardon the pun, by the Union of Department of Water and Power Employees. IBEW. IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I don't know what they do about the sisters in the Brotherhood, but there are some. Um, this is a very, very powerful union, and its business manager is very good at uh, doing well by his members. And you this all pay, all us ratepayers pay for the union to be well paid. Um, the, their proposal is essentially that we will, as a city, adopt policies that the Department of Water and Power will encourage the um, installation of these solar cells everywhere. Um, and the department will own the power uh, and supply it to the rest of us. Now, why are we suspicious of this? Uh, I am suspicious of it, as I'm sure is um, one among your reasons, because the last proposal that I dealt with from the union, from the IBEW, was a proposal to have the city, the Department of Water and Power, purchase, uh, encourage, subsidize a company that promised to build electric-powered scooters here in Los Angeles. And the arguments there were we're going to have our own industry, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be better for the air than any other transportation system we have, it's going to provide union jobs here in L.A. It turns out the guy who was going to do this turned out to be a crook. I got a call, I was chairing the committee doing the hearings on this. The state of New York called me up and said, you don't want to do business with this guy, let us tell you about our experience. 
State of Hawaii Attorney General's office called up and said, we're in court with the guy. We just want you to know that. His name wasn't Madoff, was it? No, his name was actually Tony Locrigio. <laughs> and no, I can't spell it. Do you have any friends in the IBEW? Did he? Apparently so. Like Brian Darcy? Uh, apparently yeah. so, yes. Um, and um, so the way that got done was that Brian Darcy, the head of the union, saw an opportunity. He says this was an opportunity to create union jobs. Um, I actually found out during the course of all this, we already had a company here in Los Angeles, in my district in the valley, in Van Nuys, that um, sells electric powered scooters. Now they aren't made locally, but they are sold locally through Sam's Club and a whole bunch of other um, outlets. And they were, of course, really upset that the city was proposing to subsidize somebody else to do what they already did without a subsidy, and I thought they were right. So we wound up doing it because the union at DWP persuaded the County Federation of Labor that this was an important union activity. The County Federation of Labor twisted the arm of Mayor Jim Hahn. They did not have to twist very hard, and, uh, and actually I don't think they twisted at all. They just told him. And so the mayor was in favor of this. And the mere fact that two other states were already suing the guy was not enough to derail it. So I am very uncomfortable with how thoroughly vetted the proposals that come out of the IBEW for public subsidy are. Did I say that? Now, Ron? This class only goes for another half hour. I want to ask the students. They're going to ask some questions I, I right now. I can't tell the whole story so, in half no, an hour. No, you only have, <laughs> you only have two minutes, because you could go on. I'm going to go fast. Okay. 1999, the DWP under then General Manager David Freeman announced the most ambitious solar energy plan in the United States. The city council passed a resolution written by Ruth Galanter, which I've recently dug out, and I don't mean it as a criticism, congratulating them on this great stride forward. By 2002, they had produced two or three megawatts, which is enough to light this building for a day or two, um, uh, of solar energy, thrown 30 or $40 million around community groups through public relations agency, uh, through Mitchell Schwartz's company of the LA League of Conservation Voters. It was a scam to take money and throw it into community groups to pump up a PR operation that produced nothing. At the same time this was going on, the, the IBEW, they were writing contracts, barring the top 30 users, LAUSD, from introducing solar energy into their buildings because they were afraid they would, that um, it, they would lose jobs. It would mean closing of power plants. Roll forward. They fought this tooth and nail. Today, they promised 100 megawatts. Over, by 2010, they produced 12, about 95% of it in homes on people's rooftop, mostly at their own expense. This has been fought tooth and nail because they wanted a monopoly on jobs. They, this plan that they have put forward is, is, is a blank check without any form of control. It is, it is a scandal in the making for graft and corruption. There is utterly no control over the rates. The DWP has allowed the infrastructure of its electrical system to rot to the point that it costs $5.3 billion to bring it back up to date. And they are introducing the solar energy, the least efficient form of it. Solar, solar thermal is, 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 a, is, a, is an efficient system, cost efficient. This is a blueprint for co corruption. And it was, it was put forward by the union. The city council did not even know what it was voting on. It was approved, the largest initiative in the history of the United States of solar energy, more than doubling the solar energy of the state of California, went from beginning to end through the legislative process in three weeks. 24 amendments were introduced the last 72 hours, and the council couldn't pass a test on what any of those things are, other than they were told that one of the things was that it's a charter reform measure <laughs> that gives them the absolute power to control all contracting, to change whatever is in this measure, whatever anybody puts forward as a plan at any time. They could build a nuclear plant right here in the Baluna wetlands under this plan if that's what they wanted. There is no controls, no safeguards, and there is no reason for it to be on the ballot because if they wanted to produce solar energy, all they got to do is introduce a plan, put out some contracts for bids, see what the private sector comes up with, use the subsidies. 
This is, this is absolutely the worst thing I've ever seen in my 30 years in L.A., and I've seen a lot of stuff. And, and as to the question of whether it's going to be defeated, we've started a grassroots movement out of neighborhood council peoples, activists of all sorts, and for the first time there's a grassroots movement actually getting organized. We're a bunch of amateurs, crazies, and gadflies, don't get me wrong, but, but we got a phone bank, we got a mailer that's going to come out, we got people working the streets, and, and everybody who mattered in this town who wasn't directly benefiting, the Chamber of Commerce, the private sector unions, were, were told from the beginning to just shut your mouths and stay out of this, and they thought that's what they were going to do, but they're all taking a hard look at it now, and they're beginning to wonder whether they can screw up the courage and whether it can be beaten. And I'll tell you this, is anybody in this room against solar energy? I've asked about 2,000 people in the last month or so. Everybody's for solar energy. You start with 100% support, and, there, and the support is waning as people learn about it. You're going to have a very low turnout, and, and the question is, is whether some of the prominent forces in this town will throw in a little bit of money. Laura Chick, the city controller and the only one who's shown any courage for a long time, held a news conference today and bought out the authors of this report that the DWP has mocked that says it's expensive, and they stood by their report, and she said the whole thing stinks. And, and I'm telling you, this is, this is something that has to be defeated, and the odds from 100% uh, are getting closer all the time, and there is a legitimate chance that it's going to get defeated. And if it gets defeated, we get to talk about what kind of city of Los Angeles this is going to be, and how people can participate, and the people of the city can have a seat at the table from every sector of this city. Is, is if we lose, all bets are off. But if we win, we could have the beginning of a great new city. So I'll take that I'm as uh, bad policy. I'm assuming you're going to vote against it. Um, and, and you think yeah. it's going to. It's going to lose. DJ. Well, I don't, get to vote. Questions. I don't get to vote for it or against it because I don't live, live in the city, Lakewood. Of, city of Los Angeles. But I, I would make a comment that a good deal of what, what you've been hearing today and what you may be studying in your classes uh, centers on a particular problem that, that confronts the city of Los Angeles, has confronted it for some time, at least since the mid-1970s. And that is, you know, wh where to go next? Um, the, the, the engines of, of of growth and and development in Los Angeles had formerly been uh, attached to, to, to dirt, to empty land, and that land was turned into house lots, and everyone went away happy. Now, uh, now the city's built out essentially to its its natural limits. In fact, the region's built out to its natural limits. And since the 19, mid 1970s, we've been the city's been the region too has been spasming to a certain extent, finding trying to find the next uh, engine for uh, all the things that make growth happen. And to a certain extent, it's beginning to sound in some, in some areas like the environment or, or, or environmental issues is becoming that new engine, just like the, just like the orange groves turned into house lots. Um, environmental, environmental things are becoming the engine that will pull along this freight car full of lobbyists and consultants and contractors and, and if you will, um, self-interested unions and the like. And we don't, and, and that's just, that's the story of Los Angeles from 1888 onwards. Finding the next engine that will pull this freight car, these freight car, cars forward. And then the environment may in fact be the next one. Okay, Stu, thank you. It's a great panel. Let's thank them.